When you see an I in a Russian name, it's pronounced E. E. So it's not Vladimir, it's Vladimir. Vladimir. Jeffrey Epstein. I don't know where to start with this really. I mean, he's everything about him is so weird. It's almost like a conspiracy theorist made him up. You know, he's this billionaire. He hangs about with all the most rich and powerful and famous people all over the world. He's got this plane that they call the Lolita Express that takes children to be abused on his private island on which he has built this big weird looking temple. And everything about it's just, it's mental, you know. Um, I suppose we'll start with where did his money come from because that's something that's been shrouded in mystery for a long time. So in a 2002 New York Magazine profile, he was described like this. Epstein is said to run $15 billion for wealthy clients. Yet aside from limited founder Leslie Wexner, his client list is a closely held secret. A former Dalton math teacher, he maintains a peripatetic, that's a big word, salon of brilliant scientists, yet possesses no bachelor's degree. For more than 10 years, he's been linked to Manhattan London society figure Jocelyn Maxwell, daughter of the mysteriously deceased media titan Robert Maxwell. Yet he lives the life of a bachelor, logging 600 hours a year in his various planes as he scours the world for investment opportunities, that's what he's calling it. He owns what is said to be Manhattan's largest private house, yet runs his business from a 100-acre private island in St. Thomas. Says another prominent Wall Streeter, he is mysterious, Gatsby-esque figure. He likes people to think that he is very rich, and he cultivates this air of aloofness. The whole thing is weird. And the whole thing is weird. So, I mean, this guy basically, he drops out of university in 1974. He gets no degree, he becomes a maths and physics teacher... In doing this, he meets a parent who is connected with Bear Stearns, who gets him a job at Bear Stearns in 1976. It was just like a low-level junior assistant to a floor trader. But in a meteoric rise, a meteoric Epstein-esque rise, he he quickly, you know, starts advising the bank's wealthiest clients. And in 1980, just four years after he joins Bear Stearns, he becomes a limited partner. So think about that. In 1974... He's a physics and maths teacher with no degree. And then in 1980, he's a limited partner at Bear Stearns. And I'm not necessarily saying there's anything nefarious about it. It's just, it's weird, man. It's weird that you would go from some complete obscurity to you know, that in such a long, such a short period of time. So he was asked to leave Bear Stearns as well in 1981 for some policy violations, which are, from what I can see, not clear. So then in 81, Epstein goes on to found his own consulting firm and he moves on after that. So he described his work at the time as being a high-level bounty hunter. He told friends, quote, he worked sometimes as a consultant for governments and the very wealthy to recover embezzled funds, while other times he worked for clients who had embezzled funds. This will come up as well later on, we'll talk about this in more depth. But around this time in the 80s, Jeffrey Epstein would actually straight out tell people that he was an intelligence agent. And apparently he even had an Austrian passport that had his photo, but a different name. And it said his place of residence was in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't know if he was just doing this for effect, you know, doing it to be a hit with the ladies, if you will. You know, like um, James Bond or whatever, you know, trying to pull that sort of thing. Because, I mean, if you were actually an intelligence agent, I don't imagine you would go about telling people you were an intelligence agent. You know, it just seems kind of, seems like an odd thing to do. And then for years as well, the only person that, or the only client of his, as that quote at the start mentioned, that was public, was this guy Les Wexner. And he's behind Victoria's Secret and something called The Limited. Now, this guy Les Wexner, he's never been accused of any wrongdoing. There's never been any evidence of any wrongdoing on his part. And he did break ties with Epstein over a decade ago. So that's kind of important to mention straight away. But What's interesting is apparently in the 90s, Jeffrey Epstein used to pose as a talent scout for Victoria's Secret, and he would do this to lure models and things to hotel rooms and stuff like that. 
So this is what's interesting about the relationship with these two. Historian Vox says, Epstein also obtained his Manhattan residence, a seven-storey, 21,000-square-foot mansion that's been called one of the city's largest private homes through Wexner, who purchased the property in 1989 for $13.2 million, furnished it lavishly and yet never spent more than two months there. The thing about this was records say that no money was exchanged for the transaction and some there was some rumour that Epstein only paid like a dollar for it, which would seem weird in the first place. But in this house... A raid by investigators later on, years later, would find hundreds and perhaps thousands of sexually suggestive photographs, including some that appeared to be of underage girls. We'll hear about that again as well. So there's also even questions about whether Epstein is actually even a billionaire, because Forbes has never included Epstein in its rankings of world billionaires, since apparently, according to them, they haven't seen enough proof that he is, in fact, a billionaire. In 2010, Forbes wrote... The guy they freed this week after pleading guilty to soliciting an underage prostitute is, and this bits all in capitals, not a billionaire. We repeat, not a billionaire. More likely he is worth a fraction of that because of so much uncertainty around his numbers. He's never been included in the Forbes 400 list of the richest Americans. So Forbes weren't buying his bullshit straight away. They went on to say in that the source of his wealth, a money management firm in the US Virgin Islands, generates no public records, nor has its client list ever been released. One known client, Leslie Wexner, billionaire founder of the limited clothing chain, was widely believed to be the benefactor for years and the major source of his wealth. At one time, Epstein was listed as a trustee of the Wexner Foundation, and Wexner reportedly bought Epstein a 13 million New York apartment. So apparently even, you know, people who represented victims of Epstein found problems with this later on. This guy, Spencer Coven, who was an attorney who represented three of Epstein's alleged victims, he said it was a bone of contention with Epstein's lawyers. In the litigation itself, we were never able to get him to produce verified financial information. The nine figures came up by negotiation. It kept going up and up and up. They started at zero. They wouldn't tell us at all. Some people have said, well, this proves that he's an intelligence agent or something like that. I mean, it could just be thievery, you know, like theft, tax evasion or whatever, you know, like doing something illegal. And, you know, that's probably why his clients wouldn't want anyone to know about it and why he'd be so secretive. You know what I mean? I kind of don't think, though, for our purposes, I don't think whether he was a millionaire or a billionaire is generally that important, but it could just be one more level of bullshitting because, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it's like to be in these sort of high-powered circles. I mean, maybe if you're someone that's a millionaire, then billionaires think you're scum or something like that. I don't know how it works for these people. What we do know is this guy was a sick fuck. So Epstein is accused of abusing dozens of underage girls about as young as 14, now, we mentioned the New York home earlier on. At his Pam Beach home, he allegedly had pictures of naked girls all over the walls. Some of these girls were actually being his victims. So, I mean, this is some kind of serial killer level stuff here. You know, he's literally surrounding himself with pictures of his victims. Now, the New York house that we mentioned, it sounded like that was a pretty weird place as well. So, let me read you this. Epstein kept an assortment of peculiar items in his Manhattan mansion from a lifelike human doll dangling from a chandelier, that's normal, to a human-sized chessboard with scantily clad figurines modelled after his employees, according to New York Magazine. Modelled after his employees? Fucking hell. Imagine that, you've act- you've got a chessboard and on it you've got little scantily clad, I wonder if scantily clad's a broad term, you know, figurines of people that work for you. For a start, that's a weird kind of power thing, isn't it? These these little pawns, these literal little pawns that work for you and you move the pawns, you control the whole game. But then I suppose there's also the possibility that you're going to lose the game. So it goes on to say, other oddities include individually framed prosthetic eyeballs he mounted along a hallway. My house isn't even this weird. He kept a prosthetic breast by a bathtub that he could play with while bathing. Jennifer Arroz, I'm, I'm bad with the pronunciation of all these, but I'll give them a go. A woman who claims she was abused and raped by Epstein when she was just 15 years old told NBC News in a recent interview. She said there was also photos of naked women hanging in a massage room. And naked women, could those naked women be victims of his, from what we've heard, quite possibly? And this is the same house as well where it's come out. There is this weird painting of Bill Clinton in a Monica Lewinsky-style blue dress sitting on a chair in the Oval Office. Now suddenly there's all sorts of theories and stuff about it, but let me read you this about it. 
The Clinton painting comes from a pair of works by Petrina Ryan Clyde that lightly satirised political figures. Its companion, a painting of George W. Bush called War Games, features the former president sitting on the floor of the White House, playing with paper aeroplanes and two fallen Jenga towers, referencing his manipulation of the attacks of 9-11 to justify the war in Iraq, the defining scandal of Bush's White House tenure. As for parsing Bill, that's the one we're talking about, the blue dress seems a likely reference to the blue dress that served as evidence in the former president's affair with Monica Lewinsky, the scandal that marked Clinton's time in office. Now, she said, the artist herself, she said, In 2012, as a grad student at the New York Academy of Art, I painted pictures of Presidents Bill Clinton and Bush as part of my master's thesis. When the school put on a fundraiser at the Tribeca Ball that year, they sold my painting to one of the attendees. I had no idea who the buyer was at the time. As with most of my paintings, I completely lost track of this piece when it was sold seven years ago. So it was a complete surprise to me to learn yesterday that it wound up in Epstein's home. I mean, at times I wonder if Jeffrey Epstein did a lot of stuff just so that when conspiracy people came to look into him, or, you know, while they were looking into him, that they would have so much to work off of. I don't know. I mean, I kind of get the Bill Clinton painting thing because, I mean... Because he knows Bill Clinton and he knows people that know Bill Clinton and these people come to his house, you know, and it's right there. It was right there on display for people to see. And it's just, it's making fun of him, isn't it? Especially, you know, in the Monica Lewinsky blue dress and stuff like that. You know, this is something that he's bought for a laugh. And he did all sorts of kind of weird things as well. Like, so apparently one time he sent a guy that worked for him to deliver a dozen roses to an alleged victim of his following her high school drama performance. I mean, is he fucking joking? Some like weird, sick sort of psychopathic trolling that he's up to. So in James Patterson's book that we mentioned earlier, Filthy Rich, about Epstein, it states that in 2004, he gave the Palm Beach Police Department a donation of $90,000. 90 grand. All right, I just really like what you guys do. Nothing weird at all. Here's 90 grand. So Patterson goes on to say it was generous, even by the generous standards of Palm Beach, and it was earmarked for a firearm simulator. Several months after the start of the department's investigation, Epstein called the police chief and asked if he'd bought the simulator yet. The chief hadn't, and Epstein offered more money to make it happen. At that point, the police figured Epstein knew they were investigating him. So, he can obviously see what he's doing there. You know, it doesn't really take Colombo in this case. This is just something Epstein seems to have always done. He always throws money at something. Even the fact that when, you know, a lot of young girls came came forward to accuse him. And what did Epstein do? Epstein hired a bunch of private investigators to go to, like, their MySpaces of all places and dig up any dirt they could find on these girls. You know, he just throws money and tries to turn the problem around on someone else. And this is obvious, right? Because in 1997 as well, someone identified just as a young actress went to the LAPD with accusations of sexual assault against Epstein, but it didn't result in any charges. In 2010, she told a newspaper, the cops said it'd be my word against his, and since he had a lot of money, I let it go. See, this is just, he's following this formula for years and years. You know, the rich, powerful guy, I'm above the law, I can do what I like, because, I mean, it does seem in a lot of ways that rich people seem to be able to do whatever they like. And the thing about this is, just like with Jimmy Savile, people knew about this. I mean, look at some of the comments that were made before. In 2002, Trump said, I've known Jeff for 15 years, terrific guy, he's a lot of fun to be with. It's even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, many of them on the young side. Right, and this Vanity Fair columnist, Michelle Wolf, she described flying on his private plane in the 90s. She said she was followed onto the plane by, how shall I say this, three teenage girls, not his daughters, who were 18, 19, 20, who knows, and model-like. He has never been secretive about the girls, she said. At one point when his troubles began, he was talking to me and said, what can I say, I like young girls. I said, maybe you should say, I like young women. I mean, for starters, is that just him catching himself there? Like, oh, I like young girls, women. Well, I like young women, of course. But, like, that's the thing. See, if you had, if, like, I had a friend, I'm only in my 30s and Epstein was older than that at this point, but if I had a friend who was going who was going out with teenagers, regardless of whether I thought that, you know, he was just, he had good intentions or whatever, you would think that something wasn't quite right there. You'd have to intervene. You wouldn't just be like, oh, well, he likes them quite young. I mean, who who just says shit like that? So, and apparently, again, if we go into, like, how weird and sick his mind went, he actually ended up, like, paying girls to find more girls, and he ended up, like, just being a financial guy right through and creating this kind of weird sexual pyramid scheme with these girls as well. 
you know, and obviously he's always saying that he thought they were 18 in that, but I mean, I don't know, you could ask for even a driver's license or something. I don't think they had as, as good a copy as him. I mean, he should be able to tell if it's fake or not, if he's Mr. Intelligence Agent. And the thing is, if they're under 18, they can't consent anyway, because he's always saying that oh, all of these girls consented. Well, if they are underage, which it seems like a lot of them were, then they can't consent. And we know as well this is bullshit too, because in the 2019 indictment, it stated that Epstein knew that some of the girls were underage because they, quote, expressly told him their age. But the crazy level is yet to go up a notch, and it does, because apparently he, quote, wanted to seed the human race with his DNA by impregnating women at his vast New Mexico ranch. So, yeah, apparently his goal was to have 20 women at a time impregnated at his 33,000 square foot Zorro ranch in a tiny town outside Santa Fe. So how is he going to impregnate 20 women at a time? I assume he's going to, he's going to use some kind of machine or something like that, you know, he talked before, and we'll talk about it later, about how he had a biological need for three orgasms a day, he said. So I don't know how he's going to, I mean, is he going to have some kind of, maybe this is why he had all the friends in science and engineering and things like that, because he wanted them to build like an, an Epstein-style insemination machine or something like that. But I mean, even filling that thing up would be like a lifelong task. I really don't know how he thought he was going to accomplish this at all. There's so many holes in this, it's ridiculous. And then what is he going to do with them as well? Was he just going to then just send them away or just like, I don't know, like drop them off out of a car somewhere or something like that? And I mean, the the child support, the child support would be off the chart. I mean, maybe he wanted to put all of them on one of the islands or something like that. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a really kind of weird thing to do. But I think, again, this is just another example of the weird narcissism and megalomania that he had. Because, I mean... Who actually thinks I want to seed the human race with my DNA or some shit like this? And it just goes back to remember the thing about the chessboard with all the half-naked versions of people that worked for him. It is just all this extreme narcissism. So apparently the idea for the baby ranch that he had was based on something called the Repository for Germinal Choice. Now, this was like a sperm bank that was to be stocked with a sperm of Nobel laureates. Um, and it was this kind of eugenic idea, but... Only one Nobel Prize winner, some guy called William Shockley, actually acknowledged contributing sperm to it. Other donors, apparently, there were scientists and academics or something like that. The thing discontinued in 1999, so that didn't work out too well either. I mean, what was even, what was even the purpose of it? You know, like, was he trying to create a race of, I don't know, pedophile billionaires or something? Like, it's weird, was it some, I mean, if I say it's some kind of vanity, but what vanity does it possibly really appease? You know what, my sperm was all over the place with all these children I'll never see. I don't, I don't get that at all. You know, unless you've got the temple and stuff. Now, I don't know if the temple and that was for effect, but maybe, maybe, just maybe he believed in some weird shit. And who knows, I mean, there is some lines of thought, some people that believe that reincarnation occurs down family lines and things like that. Maybe he had some kind of weird occult idea of like some kind of, I don't know, some reincarnation or something like that. You never know. I mean, it's entirely possible. Like I said, the temple could just be a troll. It could be real. I'd like to think it was real, but I don't know. At this time as well, he was actually having dinner parties and he was inviting scientists and something like that. And a lot of them like attractive, educated young women. And... You know, apparently some people think that a lot of these parties were for screening purposes, for potential, as impregnatees a word. <laughs> Mothers of his children would probably be the right way to put it. Because that's the thing, I mean, if you're going to, you know, seed the earth with your DNA, you don't want to impregnate just anybody. You want to make sure they're attractive and scientists and stuff like that. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not crazy. Let's continue down this rabbit hole of strangeness. According to the New York Times, one adherent of transhumanism said that he and Mr Epstein discussed the financier's interest in cryonics, an unproven science in which people's bodies are frozen to be brought back to life in the future. Mr Epstein told this person that he's wanted his head and penis to be frozen. Right, so not only does Epstein believe in some Futurama science shit, he wanted his head and his penis to be frozen. Now... I'm not going to spend too long on this, but we do need to discuss Jeffrey Epstein's penis for a little bit. So again, in James Patterson's book, Filthy Rich, one of his accusers is quoted as describing it as very tiny. Another told police that he has some sort of birth defect on his thing. She went on, it's like a teardrop, like a drop of water. It's really fat at the bottom and skinny at the top. Another called it egg-shaped. Egg-shaped. I don't, I'm not even sure what an egg-shaped penis would look like. 
I found this as well. So when investigators asked him specifically about his egg-shaped penis, he wasn't too pleased about that. Would you raise your right hand, please? Yes. Do you solemnly swear the testimony about to give away the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you get? Yes, I do. Could you please give us your name? Jeffrey Epstein. Is it true, sir, that um, you have what's been described as an egg-shaped penis? Form, vague and definite, and I'm going to give you the, the first warning, Mr. Cuban, that these types of questions are not only argumentative, but uh, directed in a manner to embarrass uh, Mr. Epstein. If you continue with this type of question, I'll adjourn the deposition immediately. Sir, according to the police department's probable cause affidavit, uh, one witness described your penis as oval shaped and claimed when erect it was thick towards the bottom but was thin and small towards the head portion and called it egg shaped. Those are not my words, I apologize. But as Mr. As Mr. Critton has stated that this is a... I'm willing to continue. I, I mean, are these investigators for real? I mean, they're just like, so what about your egg-shaped penis? And his lawyer's like, no, we're not talking about that. You know, you're just trying to offend him and embarrass him, whatever. And they're like, but we really need to know about your penis. You know what I mean? It's almost like they're just intentionally fucking with him. Like, I don't know, is Super Troopers real? Before they went in, Jake, they were just sitting outside being like, I'm going to ask him about the penis thing. I know you shouldn't ask him about that. I'm just going to do it. But he was not happy. He stormed out and everything. It's obviously touched a nerve there. So, I mean, that's a recap of, you know, his craziness and how he seemed to be a paedophile that everyone knew, but, you don't know, because he was famous or rich or has the goods on everyone, nobody really said anything about it. So, if we fast forward to 2007, the FBI prepared a 53-page sex crimes indictment for Epstein. They could have sent him to prison for life. Now, this was according to the Miami Herald, so he cut a deal with Alexander Acosta, who was the US attorney at the time in Miami, who later became the Labour Secretary under Trump and actually recently resigned because of all this, when all this kind of came out. Now, this allowed him to serve just 13 months in prison. Now, not in an actual prison where, you know, he can get beaten up and all the rest of it, don't drop the soap, but in a private wing of a Palm Beach County jail. That's the, the 90 grand doing its work there. This is why this is why Jeff had so much money. He had the foresight. He's like, you know, that 90 grand will come in useful later on. This is the thing, right? He was also granted work release to go to a comfortable office 12 hours a day for six days a week. And he was granted this despite the fact that the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department prohibited work release for sex offenders. Again, this is that 90 grand going to work for him. So, you know, he's not even, he's, only, he's in prison in name only. You know, he's basically not there most of the time. He just has to sleep there. I think if you offered that to most people in prison, they would take it. I mean, I'm just so glad that the US justice system never conforms to stereotypes, you know, that like rich people can just do absolutely whatever they like and just throw money at problems and they just go away. It's just as well that doesn't happen. So I'll read you this. The deal Epstein got was called a non-prosecution agreement, which granted immunity to any potential co-conspirators. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? Meaning that if any of Epstein's powerful friends were involved in his crimes, they would face no consequences. And Acosta agreed that the deal would be kept secret from the victims, preventing them from showing up in court to try to challenge it. I mean, it's bad enough when you look like Alexander Acosta. Never mind trying to act like that as well. I mean, the thing is, I do wonder what kind of pressure was put on him because... Epstein might well have been an intelligence agent. I mean, not only are you letting this guy get away with just effectively sleeping in prison, but actually keeping like victims and their families away from the information. It's just, it makes it even worse. Like, I can understand being threatened and being scared and all the rest of it, but I don't understand how you can like look yourself in the mirror after all this kind of shit, man. It's just, it's really fucked up. That's the thing. I assume with all these celebrities and stuff, whatever they were getting up to on their islands. I mean, I think it's pretty fair to assume that Epstein was probably, probably recorded a lot of people doing a lot of things they shouldn't have been doing. A lot of people we probably know all about, a lot of people who are household names. And the thing is, I mean, look, he's linked with all sorts of people, Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, Bill Clinton, but he always did seem to spend his time cultivating a lot of celebrity friends and stuff like that. And you know, obviously not all of them are going to be paedophiles, that's the thing. So, you know, the problem is, 
just sorting out who was actually, you know, because you can't blame everyone that knew him or hung out with him because, I mean, even though it seemed like a lot of people knew stuff, there was obviously a, a lot of people that would have just known him socially that didn't know anything. So just because it's because they were seen with him or something like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were in on everything. That's the thing. We'll talk more about this stuff coming out and that and then what happened in a little bit, but everyone's going to have an excuse. You know, Epstein had some interesting excuses as well. Again, in the book Filthy Rich, Patterson writes, It was a message Epstein wanted to send, something central to the case that demanded explanation. The whole shit show surrounding him was just a misunderstanding, a misrepresentation of Epstein's actual interests and intentions. Fronston, Fronston is Guy Fronston, they mean here, who was a lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein, says Mr. Epstein is very passionate about massages. And Mr. Epstein had donated over $100,000 to the Bally of Florida for massages. And the massages are therapeutic and spiritually sound for him. That is why he has so many massages. See, it was all just a misunderstanding. He's not a paedophile. He's not a sexual predator preying on young girls from broken homes who have really no other option. That's not what's going on at all. It's a misunderstanding. He's just a really, really big fan of massages. Such a big fan of massages that for some reason, I mean, why why does he pay a ballet company all that money for massages? I mean, I don't know, as part of a ballerina's training, erotic massage therapy? Possibly, I don't know. I mean, I'll probably maybe watch Swan Lake later, but like, I, it's weird, man, you know? And like, he, he expects us to believe this kind of shit. Oh, you, oh, this is all just one big misunderstanding, man. You don't understand. You just get the wrong end of the stick, that's all. Just like a wee massage, you know. So that was kind of a bit of background. So what happened this time? So in 2019, he was charged with sex trafficking and sex trafficking conspiracy in federal court in New York. Now, if he was convicted of this, he could have faced up to 45 years in prison. Now, given that Epstein was 66, I mean, up to 45 years, it doesn't look like he's going to get out at all, you know. And this would give some credence to the suicide theory, you know, because he's looking at it probably thinking, well, I'm just going to be in a prison cell the rest of my life. And compared to the life I've been living, it's just grim and depressing. Is it even worth it? And, you know, despite all the wacky bullshit that he was into about freezing his head and his cock and all that, you know, that's that's the reality was that he was most likely, I know he's got money, he could have hired expensive lawyers and all that, but I think a lot was stacked against him. And I think, you know, it just seemed like his reality was going to be life in a prison cell. Now, maybe he thought, if I kill myself, then I'll eventually be resurrected as a robot sex predator, you know, and I'll still have my original head and egg-shaped penis. <laughs> Imagine buying that transformer for your child, man. But, like, you know, that that's what he was looking at. So, I mean, it would give credence to the suicide theory as well. So, last month, federal prosecutors in New York unsealed an indictment that accused Epstein of paying girls as young as 14 to have sex with him at his Upper East Side home at his estate in Palm Beach, Florida, between 2002 and 2005. And as he faced new charges, Epstein asked the judge last month to grant him bail and allow him to stay under house arrest in his Upper East Side mansion, one of the biggest private homes in Manhattan. But the judge refused and Epstein was held at the Metropolitan Correctional Centre starting in July. So maybe then, a judge actually refusing something. Maybe at this point he realises, well he realised that the tide was turning against him. Now on Friday the 9th of August, the day before he supposedly kills himself, Hundreds of pages of court documents were unsealed. Now I'll read you this. At the heart of the documents connected to a 2015 defamation case are allegations by a woman, Virginia Roberts Giffrey, who has claimed that Epstein kept her as a teenage sex slave and that he was assisted in his efforts by a British woman. Now this is either, I said like Gislaine earlier, or Gillian or something, I think. I've heard people say both. I don't know, so I'll just maybe say Gillian or whatever. So this is called Gillian Maxwell. So her dad, Robert Maxwell, now there's too much to get into in this show, but I recommend you look up him and have a read about that. That's interesting as well. So it goes on to say, The documents unsealed Friday were produced as a result of a lawsuit Giffrey filed against Maxwell nearly two decades after her alleged abuse. So Virginia Giffrey alleges that she was working at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate in 2000 when she was 16 or 17. Now she says... Gillian Maxwell at this point recruited her to work as a masseuse for Jeffrey Epstein. Now obviously this masseuse job thing is, it's the cover they're using to abuse these girls. You know, from what I've read as well, Gillian Maxwell go out to places, she even said like trailer parks and things like that, purposefully trying to find young girls. Specifically young girls who might be, you know, from troubled backgrounds and things like that. It's easier for her to recruit them, it's easier to get away with. 
Now, in these documents, they include new allegations by Griffey she was instructed by Maxwell to have sex with former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson and former US Senator George Mitchell, among others. Now, George Mitchell said that this wasn't true, and a spokeswoman for Richardson also said this was completely false. Don't sue me. This is one of the more interesting things in these documents. They include an Amazon receipt recovered from the bins, basically, of Epstein's Palm Beach mansion for books ordered in his name, including SM101, A Realistic Introduction, Slavecraft, Roadmaps for Erotic Servitude, and Training with Miss Abernathy, A Workbook for Erotic Slaves and Their Owners. Now, it goes on to say, in the documents unsealed Friday, the other woman who alleged abuse at the hands of Epstein and Maxwell also claimed she was forced into sexual acts with Prince Andrew at Epstein's Upper East Side mansion, where she said Giffrey participated as well. Actually, Buckingham Palace responded to this, saying that this stuff about Prince Andrew is completely untrue. Interestingly, apparently they don't usually make statements responding to this kind of stuff. So they're really, you know, they're really kind of coming out swinging. It's interesting, in the kind of little black book of Epstein's that they've found since his death, there were 16 numbers for Prince Andrew in there, which, I mean, I imagine someone having 16 numbers. But then, to be fair, I mean, there's 18 numbers for Fergie in there as well, so I don't really know what that says about... The thing about the book they found is, you know, it's just a list of contacts and it's not going to be, again, it's not everyone that's going to be a pedophile in there. So there's this deposition testimony here. Um, again, I don't know how to pronounce this, but we'll go for Soyberg. Miss Soyberg also testified about sexual acts that occurred with her, Prince Andrew, and Miss Giffrey when she and Maxwell were staying at Epstein's Manhattan mansion. Now, Giffrey's lawyer said this in a document which was filed in January 2017. So, Soberg testified for court documents. I just remember someone suggesting a photo and they told us to get on the couch. And so Andrew and Virginia sat on the couch and they put the puppet, the puppet on her lap. The puppet. Oh, yes. And so then I sat in Andrew's lap and I believe on my own volition. And they took the puppet's hand and put it on Virginia's breast. And so Andrew put his on mine. It's kind of disturbing in all sorts of ways, I suppose. So, Giffrey's alleged that Epstein began sexually abusing her when she was 16, basically. Now, the documents also contain this photo, which is interesting. There's our boy there, Prince Andrew. Now, apparently this is inside Gillian Maxwell's house in London. So the lawyers said in their papers, this particular photograph corroborates Miss Giffrey's claims that there is no other reasonable explanation why an American child should be in the company of adults, not her kin, in the London house owned by the girlfriend of a now convicted sex offender. So there's more about this. In another account, the house manager for one of Maxwell's friends testified that he spoke to a 15-year-old Swedish girl who said that she'd been held on Epstein's private island. He described the girl as weeping and shaking uncontrollably as she told him that Maxwell had taken her passport and asked her for sex and that she'd been threatened by Epstein and Maxwell. So like they're like holding 15-year-old girls hostage, taking her fucking passport. And you're on an island there. What is she meant to do? Swim? And this is just stuff we know about. I mean, this is the thing. I don't want to go kind of too far off the deep end here. But there will be a lot that we're, we won't know about and that we'll never know about either. Okay, another woman described being approached by Maxwell on the campus of her university, Palm Beach Atlantic College, and being offered a job as an assistant. She said she answered phones at Epstein and Maxwell's home during her first day on the job. But on her second day, she was instructed to massage Epstein. I'm seeing the pattern. He explained to me that, in his opinion, he needed to have three orgasms a day, the woman said. It was biological, like eating. So there's that three orgasms a day thing. This is just how they do it. They find people and they're like, look, we'll give you an obscene amount of money to be a billionaire's private masseuse. And I mean, why not? If someone came up to me and said, look... All you need to do is kind of, you know, rub this this old dude with oil and stuff like that and we'll pay you an obscene amount of money. It would sound fine, but I don't know. I mean, maybe to me, someone saying masseuse, I'm immediately thinking, plus what? Like, is it just massages or is there, or, you know, if someone came up and was like, do you want to be my masseuse? I would assume that they were going to want to fuck me or me to fuck them or something like that. But these are like young girls, you know, and a lot of the times and really troubled backgrounds and things like that and you know they're getting offered something that just probably seems like a miracle to them but somebody's going to pay me a lot of money I'm going to get to go to all these beautiful places hang out with you know rich people celebrities and all that and it's got to be better than their life they're living at that point so of course they're going to go for it I mean why wouldn't they and it seems that this is just how they hooked in all these young girls now per the document Maxwell gave Giffrey tickets and hotel reservations to travel to Thailand where Giffrey says she was instructed to meet a specific young girl and bring her back to the US for Epstein and her. 
Now, apparently Giffrey also produced records of this hotel stay in Thailand. So again, this is part of what we talked about kind of at the start, this kind of weird sexual pyramid scheme you had going on, you know, where it was different girls recruiting girls, recruiting girls sort of thing. And that's how as well he's always got this steady flow of new girls coming in. Now let's talk a bit about the suicide. So Epstein was placed on a suicide watch after he was found in his jail cell July 23rd with marks on his neck. It wasn't clear whether those injuries, which were not serious, were self-inflicted or the result of an assault. Epstein told authorities he had been beaten up and called a child predator, they said. After conducting daily psychological assessments, psychologists with the Bureau of Prisons took him off suicide watch at the end of July, according to a source familiar with the matter. Because that has been kind of, some people have been saying that he was meant to be on suicide watch at the time he was taken off at the time. And from what I understand, it's not, wasn't really that abnormal. Actually, apparently his lawyers are argued for him to be taken off suicide watch. So CNN reports that a source who stood several feet away from Epstein on Thursday said he had no cuts or bruises on his face and didn't visibly appear injured. The source said it was difficult to notice whether Epstein had any markings on his neck because the jumpsuit he wore covered part of his neck. So that's this first time. It seems to be unclear whether he did try to kill himself or not. Because look, if you were trying to kill yourself and you made an arse of it and it didn't work, you're not going to tell them that's what you did because then you know you know they're going to put you on suicide watch and you're not going to get another chance to have another go at it. Now, even though he was taken off suicide watch, the guards were supposed to check on him every half hour. Now, reports are saying that guards never checked on him for about three hours. And, you know, the excuse is that, well, the guards are have been working overtime, you know, they've been working days and days of overtime, and they actually said that they fell asleep. But of all people, this is the one person who could hold the information the most damning information about the most powerful people in the world, you know, and what would that do if all that came out? Because, I mean, look, we know that Epstein had blackmailed people before. We know that was kind of his thing, you know, and of course he was recording people and for blackmail purposes. I mean, absolutely, that was the case. I mean, it's funny, if you actually look into Robert Maxwell, he was spying on people as well. But, I mean, then, this person... And all you need to do is check on him once every half hour and you don't do that. I mean, I've fucked up at work. I'm sure everyone has, but I've not fucked up that badly. You would think you would make the extra effort, at least for this person, do you know what I mean? Given the circumstances. And I'm not surprised there wasn't like some kind of extra security just drafted in just in case someone came in to bump him off. But apparently now the warden of the prison has been reassigned and the two guards, as we all suspected, have been put on leave. I assume they'll be in some lovely destination enjoying the sun they'll have probably put probably like because of the trauma they'll have suffered from you know letting jeff kill himself on their watch they'll probably get a massive payment into their bank accounts which they deserve and then we've got the whole thing about the cameras you know there's initial reports of the cameras malfunctioning and things like that and then other reports saying that they were unproven that they were they had no basis basically so the new york post says about it Although there are cameras in 9 South Wing where the convicted paedophile was being held at the Metropolitan Correctional Centre, they are trained on the areas outside the cells and not inside, according to sources familiar with the setup there. And there's reports coming out saying that these corrections officers who were on that night of his death might have falsified reports saying they checked on him that night, and there was at least one employee on that night who was not a part of the regular detail assigned to Epstein's special housing unit. I mean, come on, it's not it's not hard to... You know, people are going, oh, this is conspiracy. I mean, it, this guy that's not regularly there. Hi, I'm AJ, I'm, I'm Steve. <laughs> Maybe they were asleep. Maybe the guy that's not usually there that had, that was on that night, this mysterious prison guard, maybe he put something in their drink and then they were asleep and then he went in to check on Jeffrey. I don't know. There was this thing as well. Apparently, if you've been taken off suicide, what, you're supposed to have a cellmate too. And there was no cellmate there either. So apparently, here's a bit from New York Magazine. It says, When Epstein was returned to the special housing unit on July 29th, he was placed in a cell with a metal door and a small glass window with another as-of-yet unidentified inmate in accordance with MCC procedures. Interestingly, we found out since this was written that that cellmate in question was a former policeman called Joe Tartaglione, who's in jail. He's wound up in a quadruple murder following some kind of what looks like a drug deal gone bad, which is kind of interesting as well. 
Sometime later, it's not clear yet when, Epstein's cellmate was transferred out of the special housing unit and he was not assigned another cellmate. It's not clear how that was allowed to happen or for how long, but Epstein was alone on Friday night and found alone, dead in his cell, on Saturday morning. So that's the thing. I mean, look, there is the chance this all could have been a suicide and all this stuff might have just happened. It just might have been the way it happened. You know, and if you knew that for sure, you would just be like, fuck, this is going to look bad. You know, because it does, it looks really bad. Now, the Attorney General, William Barr, had said that there were serious irregularities at the prison. He said, I was appalled, and indeed the whole department was, and frankly, angry to learn of the MCC's failure to adequately secure this prisoner. We are now learning of serious irregularities at this facility that are deeply concerning and demand a thorough investigation. The FBI and the Office of the Inspector General are doing just that. And then he said, we will get to the bottom of what happened and there will be accountability. He would say that anyway, you ha- you kind of have to say that, you know what I mean? But I don't think we're, I don't know, I don't think we're actually ever really going to find out. There's going to be so much that's just going to be, it's just going to fade away and it's going to be completely forgotten about. So according to the reports now, they say that he hung himself with a bed sheet around his neck, tied to the top of the bunk. So this thing in the Washington Post that came out about his suicide, about how Epstein's hyoid bone was broken, now that's a bone in your neck. And apparently that bone is much more likely to be broken if somebody strangles you rather than you hanging yourself. Apparently now it can be broken when you hang yourself, but it's much less likely. However, it is possible. And then CNN are reporting that they asked a bunch of different medical experts. And apparently it is much more likely in someone that's over the age of like 50 to break their hyoid bone in a hanging. And Jeffrey Epstein was 66. So it seems that that, it could have been, from what I can see, it seems that it could have been consistent with him killing himself or being killed. And so, you know, it could have been a suicide. could have been murder. I mean, the question is this, I mean, was he an intelligence agent? Now, before we just go into there, some people have said that they think that he's still alive. You know, he's been smuggled out and taken somewhere else. I mean, I've seen there is a picture of him dead that you can find that's out there. And I mean, you know, you could say, oh, it's been faked and whatever, but if he is an intelligence agent, why would they go to all the trouble of faking his death and trying to smuggle him out? I mean, if he's if he's fulfilled his purpose, they've got all the material they need, why wouldn't they just kill him? But it's interesting, the whole thing, you know, people link, people have linked him with, you know, the Mossad and all these different things. And like we said earlier in the 80s, he did have a fake passport and he did claim, he did say to people he was an intelligence agent. Like I said earlier, I don't know if that was... I don't know, to make himself look cool or something like that, or... Because, I mean, if you were an intelligence agent, why would you go about saying that to people? I would imagine day one of intelligence agent training school is don't tell people you're a spy, basically. But apparently, the investigative journalist Vicky Ward said she was told in 2017 by a former senior White House official that US Florida District Attorney Alexander Acosta, who we talked about who handled the case in 2008, said to Trump transition interviewers, I was told Epstein belonged to intelligence and to leave it alone, and that Epstein was above his pay grade. And Acosta again, when he was asked at a press conference about this stuff, listen to this mad answer he gave. He said, so there has been reporting to that effect, and let me say there has been reporting to a lot of effects in this case, not just now, but over the years. And again, I would be hesitant to take this reporting as fact. This was a case that was brought by our office, It was brought based on the facts, and I look at the reporting and others. I can't address it directly because of our guidelines, but I can tell you that a lot of reporting is going down rabbit holes. That's a a lot of words to say absolutely nothing. There's reports, and based on those reports, our team looked at reports, and at the time there was reports that suggested things about reports, but the reports suggested something different. You know, it's just like he's saying, absolutely nothing. And there's this interview that's popped up in New York Magazine with a former bodyguard and driver of Epstein's called Igor Zinoviev. Read you a bit of this. When Jeffrey Epstein pleaded guilty to soliciting an underage girl for prostitution in 2008 and served a 13-month sentence under the cushiest of conditions, it was his bodyguard and driver, former UFC fighter Igor Zinoviev, who frequently picked him up at the Palm Beach jail and shuttled him between the office and various appointments. Zinoviev also trained Epstein in a regimen that included weightlifting, and some light fighting drills. And whenever Epstein jetted around his various estates, Zinoviev accompanied him, riding along in the pretend billionaire's Lolita Express. Now this journalist had interviewed Igor back in 2015, 
and now he's just interviewed him again after, you know, all this supposed suicide and all that. And it's very interesting to see how the story has changed in this time. I'll read you some wee bits of this. So in our conversation in 2015, you describe his relationship with teenage girlfriends. Quote, so many time I tried to stop him. I tried to tell him my opinion about that. He don't listen to me. That's the reason why I'm not working for him no more. I make him do that or let me go. Do you remember saying that? And Igor says, it's not the teenage girls. I never see the teenage girls. I tell you, I never see teenage girls. Plenty of time when I work for him, I never see anything improper or teenage girls around him. That's what I say. Now, even Igor doesn't speak English as a first language. You can still tell this is a highly nervous person. He's like, I, I see nothing, nothing. So the interviewer goes on to ask him, so now you say you only saw him with women older than 18, 20? And Igor says, all I say is that he has always been with girlfriends and there was a couple girls. I don't remember their names. She was 25 and worked for him as an assistant, maybe 25 or 23, whatever. I don't know the age. The reporter goes on to say, okay, but you definitely told me that last time we talked. And he says, no, no, it's not that. He working like work release or other stuff. And I just tell him, you know, he would order his girlfriends around and I told him, calm down, it's not just teenage girls. I never see teenage girls in my life at his house. That's what it is. That's a misunderstanding completely. That's because that's what I'm saying. Most of the time with reporters, they give me that kind of question. Who told you I see the teenage girls? I never see the teenage girls in my life. And they said I was. The reporter goes on to say, here's another quote from our last interview. Quote, he had a couple of girlfriends. They have no idea the degree of what they are doing, but you can't tell nothing to them because they support him, kind of. For the while, this one girl can be more attracted to him. He just fire her, fire them, and then keep them away. For example, I give you some idea. You have private play and you have three girlfriends, and one girl can be more attached to him. And next week, he don't take that girl. He takes another one. He just switch them. He brings them on a couple of trips and then gets different girls. That's what he doing. Remember that? Igor says, kind of not. And she says, Igor. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. The reporter says, I understand this is sensitive. He jumps in and says, it's not sensitive. It's just kind of a little incorrect. The reporter says, it's exactly what you said. I can send it to you. Here's something else you said, quote, it could be tricky, you know, normally. He always checks his newspapers. Nothing about me, I say. No, he say, they forget about me. And when I mentioned Epstein was being exposed for messing with teenage girls, you said, I'm not surprised at all, I'm just surprised how low he can be outside the real world. Somebody is going to call him and it will be real jail. He'll have so much money he can pay it off. Me personally, if I caught him with my daughter or something, do that, I'm not going to go to the police, I do something else, much worse. That guy could try to sue me and manipulate the situation with his money. That's the American way. I know he screwed up a lot of fashion girls also, that's a different story. Do you remember saying that? He says, I remember one thing I say, like, if I be the father and somebody screw up my daughter, I don't give a shit about how much money they have. I definitely do some bad thing. That's what I said before that stuff. I don't know. I'm just really like, she jumps in and says, Igor, I'm not making stuff up. I was very careful. And he says, I'm really careful too. And Igor in this, he claims to be not afraid of anyone. He just wants things to be corrected, things like that. But it sounds like he's a bit afraid to me. And I mean, who can blame him? I'd be too. And remember, this guy was actually in the Soviet Special Forces at one point. So then the reporter starts asking Igor about his death. You think somebody helped him kill himself? Yeah. Okay, why? Listen, you know, there's go that's going a little too deep. I mean, I'm just trying to understand that maybe you'd be happy he was dead or you would be upset. I don't know. Are you even feeling anything? And Igor says, I'm not sad. I mean... I didn't have anything against him, like a bad thing, you know. I don't care about his life completely. I don't give a, let's say, like crap about how he die, how he live, or how he's managed. So he thinks somebody helped him kill himself. That's a really nice way of saying murder, isn't it? Because the only reason you would need somebody to help you is like if you're incapable or you're too scared to like do it yourself. Now this guy claims that nobody offered him money and no one tried to silence him, obviously. And he does say in this, like, he just wants, he just wants out of it. He wants to be left alone. You know, you do get that impression that he's like, look, I may have worked for this guy before. Now this is all hitting the fan. Just leave me the fuck out of this completely. Like, I won't talk. I won't do it. Just fucking, I don't need money. Just leave me. Or else, you know, somebody, somebody might have, say, put something substantial in his bank account to help him, you know, square this up. The reporter goes on to say, okay, one thing you told me is he got a heads up when the authorities were going to come to his house the night before. Listen, what you say is between you and me. You told me he would get phone calls the night before and 8 o'clock the police are going to come. 
he would get a heads up from local police and then Igor was silent. You told me that Igor want me to read the quote. He says, well, you can read whatever you want right now. Don't just, you can put yourself in big trouble. And so the reporter goes on to say, you said he always do something wrong. There were some nights in question. There was at home arrest and police before they come to the house. They call them and tell them they're coming at eight o'clock in the morning. It's all corruption, you know, it's all bullshit. And he says, listen, don't put yourself in trouble, seriously. And then they go on for a bit more with this kind of thing. Like the reporter says, I'm telling you to give a chance to remember because we talked about this stuff. I know it's hard. I don't know what you mean about put myself in trouble. And Igor says, let that go, seriously, let that go. And the reporter says, why Why is it so important? Are you worried about the local cops? He says, listen, you're really smart and I'm not going to offer that over the phone right now, okay? You're really smart. You have no idea. Please. Oof. What do you mean by that? I can't explain you over the phone any of this. I'm sorry about the way this is. Like I said, English not his first language, so the way it's written is a bit kind of, it's not the easiest to read. The reporter says, you said that last time and we didn't talk for years. You can tell the world who this guy was. You were with him for a long time, you know what I mean? And there's just silence from Igor. I totally understand that you think he could have had help committing suicide. And then Igor says, first of all, I have to go right now. <laughs> I have another client. First thing, I need to leave. The reporter says, still training people? Yes, but just be careful. I'm not kidding. What's your email so I can send you? Don't do any kind of that stuff. Just don't play it. Seriously. Can you tell me why? I can't. I can't. May I ask you one more question? Go ahead. Have you been talking to anyone in the government, the FBI? Have they come to you? At which point there's a long pause from Igor and he says, uh, great talking to you, seriously, we talk later. Really? Bye. All right, bye. So, I mean, that doesn't look great, does it, to be fair? You know, and in a way you can kind of be like, this must be, I mean, well, for a start I was going to say, you kind of feel sorry for him because, you know, maybe he was just looking for a job and this job paid well and stuff like that. But, I mean, if he was that close to Epstein, he must have been quite, he must have known exactly what was going on and then he still stayed with him for, like, five or six years. So, you know, given that, I'm kind of like, fuck this guy. But, yeah, you can tell he's really fucking worried, man. That is, like, I mean, no wonder. I would be too because was, he probably knows things that could get him killed. And it's interesting that bit at the end, they ask him about the government and all that and he just like, okay, bye, see you later. Definitely the words of someone who is very worried, probably rightly so. It's interesting, the Observer says, It seems awfully coincidental that Epstein's best pal and business partner for decades has been Gillian Maxwell, the British socialite and daughter of the late Robert Maxwell, the media mogul who died under mysterious circumstances in 1991. Something of a Bond villain turned real life, Maxwell loved the limelight despite being a swindler and a spy. British counterintelligence assessed that Maxwell was working for the KGB, well, pervasive allegations that he was working for Mossad too are equally plausible. So again, so you've got all this stuff with Robert Maxwell. Obviously, you know, Jeffrey Epstein being so close to Galeen Maxwell, them having dated before she became his weird madam and this whole horrible thing. So that does give the intelligence thing more credence. He's obviously close to these people. There is obviously the idea as well that maybe, you know, he liked to blackmail people and he started doing this anyway, and then someone in intelligence got wind of it and then began using him. I mean, I suppose that's possible too. Because, I mean, think about it. If you were in intelligence and you found out that this guy had all this, you know, evidence of all these powerful, famous people having sex with these underage girls and even had video or something of it, you know, of course you would want that information because think of how much power that information would give you. You know, the thing is, there's reports about diaries that he kept. I don't know, maybe we'll see them. Maybe maybe there'll be a mysterious fire or the diaries will hang themselves or something like that. I mean, people have talked about as well the possibility, was there some kind of dead man switch here? Was there, did he have some contingency plan that stuff could be, stuff was put somewhere safe and would be released upon his death. I mean, so far that doesn't seem to happen. I don't know how often does stuff like that actually happen. It kind of seems more like a movie sort of trope. I mean, that's the thing. If there is, some people have even speculated that it could be, there could be stuff like buried on his island and things like that. You know, I mean, there's going to be all sorts of stories about it, but... And then it got weirder after this because people were all like, oh, where's Gillian Maxwell gone now? She's probably going to be in hiding or something like that. And then the New York Post run this thing where she turns up just sitting at an In-N-Out burger in LA reading a book. And funnily enough, the book she's meant to be reading is called The Book of Honor, The Secret Lives and Deaths of CIA Operatives. I mean, of all things. So, you know, 
you think, oh, she could be wanted by the police, she could be killed by someone, and she's just just sitting there eating a burger, apparently saying like, oh, well, this is the last time I'll be eating here. But interestingly, it seems like, funnily enough, this might have all been staged. Now, the Daily Mail, I've got my issues with the Daily Mail, but they did an investigation on this. So let me read you a couple of things here. So, according to the photograph's metadata reviewed by DailyMail.com, the photograph is tagged with Meadowgate. Metadata provides information about the rights of the photograph to users. Safian is president of Meadowgate Media Investments Incorporated, according to public records. The in and out burger joint picture was published by the New York Post on Thursday after they obtained it from Safian 60. Now, the Safian they're talking about is Lee Safian, who is Galeen's friend and attorney. So the Mail report goes on to even say that it might be photoshopped. It says, The Mail and Sunday reported this weekend that one of America's biggest outdoor advertising companies alleged that at least one photo of Maxwell had been altered. Behind Maxwell can be seen a bus shelter displaying an ad for the movie Good Boys, which opened in the US this past Friday. There's only one problem. That particular bus shelter has displayed a poster advertising the Province St. Joseph's Medical Centre since July 28th and continues to do so, according to an Outfront Media spokeswoman, Carly Zip. We think it was Photoshop, says Zip in New York. We don't have any records of this, talking about the poster, being posted here. I mean, that's just fucking... It's crazy, man, do you know what I mean? Like, that not only might this be some kind of thing, like, for her appearance and stuff like that, but also doing advertising at the same time, if this is true. I mean, that is, that's the world we're living in just now. That is the reality of what's going on. And from what I can see as well, the victims are bringing a civil suit against Epstein's estate and Maxwell too. But you know, it's in the news now, and people are talking about it. But this will all go away. Any outrage that's that's around just now, that'll just die off. Other things, the news cycle will move on. Other things will happen. You'll forget about it. You know, there'll maybe be conspiracy podcasts and things where you'll hear about it now and again. And this will be this will be talked about for quite a while, you know, given all the weirdness surrounding it and stuff like that. I mean, it's possible he could have killed himself, absolutely. It looks bad, but, you know, all the circumstances... It could have gone either way, that's the thing. It looks dodgy as fuck though. I mean, of course it does. Because people are like, he's gonna get he's gonna wind up dead, and then all of a sudden he does. Like I said, I mean, you're you're him, you're that age, you're gonna be facing I mean I mean you couldn't really see him getting out of this one at this point. It seemed like he'd fulfilled his purpose at this stage. So he's gonna be spending what the rest of his existence in a prison cell. It doesn't strike me as something that a jet setting millionaire would want to be doing. So I mean, it's entirely possible that he could have killed himself. You know, such a weird guy. He had this obviously this real god complex. You know, we talked about wanting to seed the human race and all this kind of thing. And even to the, the weird chessboard with the scantily clad employees as the pieces on it. You know, so much so bizarre, man. But yeah, people will forget about this, you know. People will just go back to their Netflix and their Amazon and their Uber Eats and they won't worry about what all these, you know, what all these rich, powerful people, these celebrities that are making these decisions that they see on TV all the time, they won't wonder what they've done. They'll just let it go as, and this is what will always happen, you know? And what about the victims? What are their names? You know, I bet you most people, well, they know all this salacious stuff of people that hung about with Jeffrey Epstein. They might not know about the people that were abused. They probably don't know about any of them. For example, one woman who said that Epstein molested her, she was found dead of a heroin overdose last year, leaving behind a young son. Courtney Wilde, she was a 14-year-old middle school student and cheerleading captain when she met Jeffrey. She later became addicted to drugs and served three years in prison and drugs charges. 32-year-old Jennifer Arroz said in an interview with NBC's Today, I said this earlier, he raped me, he forcefully raped me. So that's the, you know, the consent thing again going out the window. Wonder if the agent that finished Jeff off has for his consent first. <laughs> well, that's the thing, those people I mentioned, just a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean of victims that probably we'll never ever hear about. You know, and you can say, Oh, well, that's over now. It's never over for these girls. Look at what's happening. I don't think they would be, you know, like into all these drugs and things like that, ending up in prison and stuff. What's happened to them has completely destroyed their lives and most likely the lives of a lot of people around them. Like I said, you know, the outrage, it'll die down, people will forget about it, they'll never question who was there, what they were doing, what evidence might exist, that'll all just be forgotten about. Looks like a lot of people might have dodged a bullet there. 
You know, it's interesting to think as well because if he was some kind of intelligence agent, it's a very Faustian sort of story. You know, this guy who sells his soul to the devil, or obviously in Jeff's case, an intelligence agency, you know, in exchange for a life of, you know, partying and jet setting and all the rest of it. You know, there's a point when the party's well and truly over and you're alone in a cold, dark cell and then the devil comes looking for you.